crown of gold. Time honored Lancaster. Hast thou, according to thy oath and ban, brought hither Henry Hereford, thy bold son, here to make good the boisterous late appeal, which then our leisure would not let us hear, against the Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Mowbray? I have, my liege. Tell me, moreover, hast thou sounded him if he appealed the Duke on ancient malice, or worthily, as a good subject should, on some known ground of treachery in him? As near as I could sift him on that argument, on some apparent danger seen in him, aimed at your highness. Then call them to our presence, face to face, and frowning brow to brow, ourselves will hear the accuser and the accused freely speak. High stomach to the cloak, and full of ire, in rage, deaf as the sea, hasty as fire. <laughs> Many years of happy days befall my gracious sovereign, my most loving liege. Each day still better others happiness, until the heavens envying earth could hap add an immortal title to your crown. Yeah, we thank you both, yet one but flatters us, as well appeareth by the cause you come, namely to appeal each other of high treason. Cousin of Hereford, what dost thou object against the Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Mowbray? First, the heaven be the record to my speech. In the devotion of a subject's love, tendering the precious safety of my prince, and free from other misbegotten hate, come I appellant to this princely presence. Now, Thomas Mowbray, do I turn to thee, and mark my greeting well. For what I speak, my body shall make good upon this earth, or my divine soul answer it in heaven. Thou art a traitor and a miscreant, too good to be so, and too bad to live, since the more fair and crystal is the sky, the uglier seen the cloud that in it fly once more. For more to aggravate the note, with a foul traitor's name stuff I thy throat, and wish so please my sovereign ere I move. What my tongue speaks, my right to on sword may prove. Let not my cold words here accuse my zeal. Tis not the trial of a woman's war. The bitter clamour of two eager tongues can arbitrate this course betwixt us twain. The blood is hot that must be cool for this. First, the fair reverence of your highness curbs me from giving reins and spurs to my free speech, which else would post until it had returned these terms of treason doubled down his throat. Setting aside his high blood's royalty, I do defy him and I spit at him. <coughs> Call him a slanderous coward and a villain, which to maintain I would allow him odds and meet him when I tied her on a foot even to the frozen ridges of the Alps or any other ground inhabitable where every Englishman dare set his foot. Pale, trembling coward. There I throw my cage, disclaiming here my kindred of the king, and lay aside my high blood's royalty, which fear but reverence makes thee to accept. If guilty dread have left thee so much strength as to take up mine honour's pawn, then stoop. I take it up. And by that sword I swear that gently laid my knighthood on my shoulder, I'll answer thee in any fair degree your chivalrous design of knightly trial. And when I mount alive, may I not light if I be traitor or unjustly fight. If what doth our cousin lay to Mowbray's charge? It must be great that can inherit us so much as a thought of ill in him. Look what I speak. My life shall prove it true. That Mowbray hath received 8,000 nobles in name of lendings for your highness's soldiers. The which he hath detained for lewd employments. <laughs> Besides, I say, and will in battle prove that all the treasons for these eighteen years can plotted and contrived in this land fetch from false Mowbray their first head and spring. Ah. <laughs> further, I say, and further will maintain that he did plot the Duke of Gloucester's death and consequently, like a traitor coward, Sluiced out his innocent soul through streams of blood. How high a pitch. His resolution soars. Thomas of Norfolk. What sayest thou to this? Oh, let my sovereign turn away his face and bid his ears a little while be deaf till I have told this slander of his blood how God and good men hate so foul a liar. Mowbray, impartial are our eyes and ears. Were he my brother, nay, my kingdom's heir, as he is but my father's brother's son. Now, by my scepter's awe, I take a vow. 
Such neighbor nearness to our sacred blood should nothing privilege him, nor partialize the unstooping firmness of my upright soul. He's a subject, Mowbray, so art thou, free speech and fearless, I to thee allow. Then, Bolingbroke, as low as to thy heart through the false passage of thy throat thou liest. Three parts of that receipt I had for Callus dispersed I duly to his highness soldiers. The other part reserved I by consent, and if my sovereign liege was in my debt upon remainder of a dear account, for last I went to France to fetch his queen. Mm. Now, swallow down that lie. For Gloucester's dead. I slew him not. But to mine own disgrace neglected my sworn duty in this case. For you, my noble lord of Lancaster, the honorable father to my foe, once did I lay an ambush for your life, a trespass that doth vex my grieved soul. But ere I last received the sacrament, I did confess it and exactly begged your grace's pardon, and I hope I had it. This is my fault. As to the rest of Peeled, it issues from the rancor of a villain. A recreant and most degenerate traitor, which in myself I boldly will defend and interchangeably hurl down my gauge upon this overweening traitor. Fuck! Raw, kindle, gentlemen, be ruled by me. Let's purge this collar without letting blood. This we prescribe, though no physician. Deep malice makes too deep incision. <laughs> forget, forget. Conclude and be agreed. Our doctors say this is no month to bleed. <laughs> Good uncle, let this end. When it began, we'll calm the Duke of Norfolk, you, your son. To be a make peace shall become my age. Throw down my son, the Duke of Norfolk's king. And Norfolk, throw down his. When, Harry, when? Obedience bids I should not bid again. Norfolk, throw down, we bid, there is no boot. Myself I throw, red sovereign, at thy foot. I am disgraced, impinched, and baffled here. Pierced to the soul on slander's venomed spear, the which no balm can cure but his heart blood that breathed this poison. Rage must be withstood. Give me his gauge. Lions make leopards tame. Yea, but not change his spots. Take but my shame, and I resign my gage. My honor is my life. Both grow in one. Take but my honor, and my life is done. Then, good my liege, my honor let me try. In that I live, and for that will I die. Cousin, throw down his gaze, do you begin. Oh, God, defend my soul from such deep sin, where my tongue shall wound mine honor with such feeble wrong, or sound so base a pal. My teeth shall tear the slavish motive of recanting fear, and spit it, bleeding in its high disgrace, where shame doth harbor, even in Mowbray's face. We were not born to sue, but to command. Which, since we cannot do to make you friends, be ready, as your life shall answer it, at Coventry, upon St. Lambert's day, where shall your swords and lances arbitrate the swelling difference of your settled hate? Since we cannot atone you, we shall see justice design the victor chivalry. Lord Marshal, command our officers at arms, be ready to direct these home alarms. champion the cause of his arrival here in arms. Ask him his name and orderly proceed to swear him in the justice of his cause. In God's name and the king's, say who thou art. 
And why thou comest thus knightly clad in arms? Against what man thou comest, and what thy quarrel? Speak truly on thy knighthood and thy oath, and so defend thee heaven and thy valour. My name is Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk. Hither come engaged by my oath, both to defend my loyalty and truth against the Duke of Hereford that appeals me, and by the grace of God and this mine arm, to prove him in defending of myself a traitor to my God, my King, and me. And as I truly fight, defend me, heaven. Marshal, the man of yonder knight in arms, both who he is, and why he cometh hither, thus plated in habiliments of war, and formally, according to our law, depose him in the justice of his cause. What is thy name? And wherefore comest thou before King Richard in his royal lists? Against whom comest thou? And what thy quarrel? Speak like a true knight, and so defend thee, heaven. Harry of Hereford, Lancaster, and Derby are mine, who ready here to stand in arms to prove, by God's grace and my body's valour, enlists on Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk. But he's a traitor, foul and dangerous, the God of heaven, King Richard, and to me. And as I truly fight, defend me, heaven. On pain of death, no person be so bold or daring hardy as to touch the lists, except the marshal, and such officers appointed to direct these fair designs. Lord Marshal, and let me kiss my sovereign's hand and bow my knee before his majesty. The appellant in old duty greets your highness and craves to kiss your hand and take his leave. We will descend and fold him in our arms. <laughs> Cousin of Hereford, as thy cause is right, so be thy fortune in this royal fight. Farewell, my blood. Which if today thou shed, lament we may, but not revenge thee dead. Oh, let no noble eye profane a tear for me if I be gored with Mowbray's spear. As confident as is the falcon's flight against a bird do I with Mowbray fight. My loving lord, I take my leave of you. Of you, my noble cousin, Lord O'Merle. For thou, the earthly author of my blood, add proof unto mine armour with your prayers. And Furbish knew the name of John Gaunt, even in the lusty Hagar of his son. God, in thy good cause, make thee prosperous. Be swept like lightning in the execution. And let thy blows, doubly redoubled, fall like amazing thunder on the cask of thy adverse pernicious enemy. Mine innocence and Saint George to thrive. Most mighty liege, and my companion peers, take from my mouth the wish of happy years, as gentle and as jocund as to jest go I to fight. Truth hath a quiet breast. Mm, farewell, my lord. Securely I espy virtue with valour couched in thine eye. Order the trial, marshal, and begin. Harry of Hereford, Lancaster, and Derby, receive thy sword, and God defend the right. And go bear this sword to Thomas, Duke of North. Lancaster and Derby stands here for God, his sovereign and himself, to prove the Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Mowbray, a traitor to his God, his king, and him. Here standeth Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, both to defend himself and to approve Henry of Hereford, Lancaster and Derby, to God, his sovereign, and to him, disloyal. Sound trumpets. Set forward, combatants. The king hath thrown his water down. Let them lay by their swords. And trumpets sound while we return these dukes. What we decree. Draw near. 
and list what, with our council, we have done. For that our kingdom's earth should not be soiled with that dear blood which it hath fostered. And for our eyes do hate the dire aspect of civil wounds ploughed up with neighbor's sword. And for we think the eagle-winged pride of sky-aspiring and ambitious thoughts with rival-hating envy set on you to wake our peace, which in our country's cradle draws the sweet infant breath of gentle sleep which so roused up with boisterous, untuned drums, with harsh resounding trumpets, dreadful bray, and grating shock of wrathful iron arms, might from our quiet confines fright fair peace and make us wade even in our kindred's blood. Therefore, we banish you our territories. You, Cousin Hereford, upon pain of life, till twice five summers have enriched our fields, shall not re-greet our fair dominions, but tread the stranger paths of banishment. Your will be done. This must my comfort be. That sun that warms you here shall shine on me. And those his golden beams to you here lent shall point on me and gild my banishment. Hmm. Northup. And for thee remains a heavier doom, which I, with some unwillingness, pronounce. The sly, slow hours shall not determinate the dateless limit of thy dear exile. The hopeless word of never to return breathe I against thee upon pain of life. The heavy sentence, my most sovereign liege, and all unlooked for from your highness' mouth. Mm -hmm. And dear a minute, not so deep a main must have been cast forth in the common air have I deserve it from your highness' hands. The language I have learned these forty years, my native English must I now forgo. And my tongue's use is to me no more than an unstringed viol or a harp. Or like a cunning instrument cased up within my mouth, you have jailed my tongue. And dull, unfeeling barren ignorances made my jailer to attend on me. I am too old to fall upon a nurse, too far in years to be a pupil now. What is this sentence then but speechless death that robs my tongue of breathing native breath? It boots thee not to be compassionate after our sentence plaining comes too late. Then, as I turn me from my country's light, to dwell in solemn shades of endless night. Return again, and take an oath with thee. Lay on our royal sword your banished hands. Swear by the duty that you owe to God to keep the oath that we administer. You never shall. So help you, truth and God, embrace each other's love in banishment. Nor never look upon each other's face. Nor never write, regrease, nor reconcile this lowering tempest of your home bred hate. Nor never by advised purpose meet to plot, contrive, or complot any ill against us, our state, our subjects, or our land. I swear. And I, to keep all this. Norfolk, confess thy treasons ere thou fly the realm. Since thou hast far to go, bear not along the clogging burden of a guilty soul. No, bawling brook! If ever I were traitor, let my name be blotted from the book of life, and I from heaven banished as from hence. But what thou art, God, thou, and I do know. And all too soon I fear the king shall rue. Farewell, my liege. Now nowhere can I stray. Save back to England, all the world's my way. Uncle, even in the glasses of thine eyes, I see thy grieved heart. Thy sad aspect hath from the number of his banished years plucked four away. Six frozen winters spent return with welcome home from banishment. 
How long a time lies in one little word? Four lagging winters and four wanton springs end in a word. Such is the breath of kings. I thank my liege that in regard of me he shortens four years of my son's exile. But little vantage shall I reap thereby. For ere the six years that he hath to spend can change their moons and bring their times about. My oil dried lamp and time be wasted light will be extinct with age and endless night. My inch of taper will be burned and done, and blindfold death not let me see my son. Why, uncle, thou hast many years to live. But not a minute, king, that thou canst give. Shorten my days thou canst with solemn sorrow, and pluck nights from me, but not lend a morrow. Thy son is banished upon good advice, where to thy tongue a party verdict gave. Why an hour justice seems so then to lower? Things sweet to taste, prove indigestion sour. You urged me as a judge, but I had rather you would have bid me argue like a father. Oh, had it been a stranger, not my child, to smooth his fault I should have been more mild. But you gave leave to my unwilling tongue against my will to do myself this wrong. Cousin, farewell. And uncle bid him so. Six years we banish him. And he shall go. My lord, farewell. What presence must not know. From where you do remain, let papers show. Cousin, no leave take I, for I will ride as far as land may let me by your side. Oh, to what purpose dost thou forward thy words that thou returnst no greeting to thy friend? I have too few to take my leave of you. Come, my son, I'll bring thee on thy way. Had I thy youth and cause, I would not stay. In England's ground, farewell. Sweet soil, adieu. My mother, and my nurse that bears me yet. Where'er I wander, boast of this I can. Though banished, yet a true-born Englishman. <laughs> Yeah, we did observe. Mm -hmm. Ah, Cousin O'Merle, how far brought you High Hereford on his way? I brought High Hereford, if you call him so, but to the next highway. Uh -huh. And there I left him. And say, what store of parting tears were shared? Well, faith, none of me. But that the northeast wind, which then blew bitterly against our faces, awaked the sleeping room, and so by chance did grace our hollow parting with a tear. Yeah, what said our cousin when you parted with him? Farewell. Ah. <laughs> and for my heart's disdain it that my tongue should so profane the word, that taught me craft to counterfeit oppression of such grief that words seemed buried in my sorrow's grave. Ah. Marry, would the word farewell have lengthened hours and added years to his short banishment, he should have had a volume of farewells. But since it would not, he had none of me. He is our cousin. <coughs> cousin. But his doubt when time shall call him home from banishment, whether our kinsman come to see his friends. <laughs> Ourself and Bushy, Baggett here and Green, observed his courtship of the common people. <laughs> How did he seem to dive into their hearts with humble and familiar courtesy? What reverence he'd throw away on slaves, wooing poor craftsmen with the craft of smiles and patient underbearing of his fortune. Off goes his bonnet to an oyster wench. Brace of Draymond bid God speed him well and had the tribute of his supple knee with... Thanks, my countrymen, my loving friends, as were our England in reversion, his and he, our subjects, next to green hope. Well, he is gone, and with him go these thoughts. Now, for the rebels which stand out in Ireland, expedient manage must be made, my liege, ere further leisure yield them further means for their advantage and your highness' loss. We will ourself in person to these wars. And for our coffers, with too great a court and liberal largesse, are grown somewhat light. <laughs> we are enforced to farm our royal realm, the revenue whereof shall furnish us for our affairs in hand. 
If that comes short, our substitutes at home shall have blank charters, where too, when they shall learn what men are rich, they shall subscribe them for large sums of gold and send them after to supply our wants. For we will make for Ireland presently. Bushy, what news? Old John of Gaunt is grievous sick, my lord, suddenly taken, and have sent post haste to entreat your majesty to visit him. Well, I see. At Ely House. Now put it, God, in the physician's mind to help him to his grave immediately. <laughs> <laughs> the lining of his coffer shall make coats to deck our soldiers for these Irish wars. Come, gentlemen, let's all go visit him. Pray God we may make haste and come too late. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> I may breathe my last in wholesome counsel to his unstayed youth. Vex not yourself, nor strive not with your breath, for all in vain comes counsel to his ear. Ah, but they say the tongues of dying men enforce attention like deep harmony. Though Richard, my life's counsel would not hear, my death's sad tale may yet undeaf his ear. No, it is stopped with other flattering sounds as praises of whose taste the unwise are fond. Lascivious meters to whose venom sound the open ear of youth doth always listen. Reports of fashions from proud Italy, whose manners still our tardy apish nation limps after in base imitation. Direct not him whose way himself will choose, tis breath thou lackst. And that breath wilt thou lose. Methinks I am a prophet new inspired, and thus expiring to foretell of him. His rash, fierce blaze of riot cannot last, for violent fires soon burn out themselves. This royal throne of kings, this sceptred eye, this earth of majesty, this seat of Mars, this other Eden, demi-paradise, this fortress built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war, this happy breed of men, this little world, this precious stone set in the silver sea, which serves it in the office of a wall, or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happier lands. This blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England, this nurse, this teeming womb of a royal king, feared by their breed and famous by their birth, renowned for their deeds as far from home for Christian service and true chivalry, as is the sepulchre and stubborn jury of the world's ransom, blessed Mary's son. This land of such dear souls, this dear, dear land, dear for her reputation through the world, is now least out. I die pronouncing it like to a tenement or pelting farm. England, bound in with the triumphant sea, whose rocky shore beats back the envious siege of watery Neptune, is now bound in with shame, with angry blots, and rotten parchment bonds. That England that was wont to conquer others hath made a shameful conquest of itself. Would the scandal vanish with my life? How happy then were my ensuing death. <laughs> the king comes. 
deal mildly with his youth for young hot coats being rained to rage them all. Oh, there's our noble uncle Lancaster. What comfort, man? How is it with aged gaunt? Oh, that name befits my composition. Mm. Old gaunt, indeed. And gaunt in being old. Ah. <laughs> gaunt am I for the grave. Gaunt as a grave, whose hollow womb inherits not but bones. Can sick men play so nicely with their names? No. Misery makes sport to mock itself. Since thou dost seek to kill my name in me, I mock my name, great king, to flatter thee. Should dying men flatter with those that live? No, no, men living flatter those that die. Thou now dying sayest thou flatterest me. Oh, no. Thou diest. Though I the sicker be. I am in health. I breathe and see thee ill. Now he that made me knows I see thee ill. Ill in myself to see, and in thee seeing ill. Thy deathbed is no lesser than thy land, wherein thou liest in reputation sick. My cousin, Wert thou regent of the world, it were a shame to let this land by lease. But for thy world enjoying but this land, is it not more than shame to shame it so? Landlord of England art thou now, not king. Thy state of law is bondslave to the law. And, and thou, thou a lunatic lean with it, fool! Presuming on an aid used privilege, dare us with thy frozen admonition make pale our cheek, chasing the royal blood with fury from his native residence. Now, by my seat, right royal majesty, wert thou not brother the great Edward's son, this tongue that runs so roundly in thy head should run thy head from thy reverend shoulders. Oh, spare me not, my brother Edward's son, for that I was his father Edward's son. That blood already, like the pelican, Hast thou tapped out and drunkenly caroused, mm. my brother Gloucester? <coughs> plain, well meaning souls, whom fair befall in heaven, my happier souls, may be a precedent and witness good that thou respect not spilling Edward's blood. Mm. Live in thy shame, but die not shame with thee. These words hereafter. Thy tormentors be. Convey me to my bed, then to my grave. Love they to live, that love and honor them. And let them die that age and sullens have. For both hast thou, and both become the grave. I beseech your majesty, impute his words to wayward sickliness and age in him. He loves you on my life, and holds you dear as Harry, Duke of Hereford. Were he here. Right. You say true. Mm, as Hereford's love, so his. As theirs, so mine, and all be as it is. My liege, oh, gone commends him to your majesty. Ah, uh -huh. what says he? Nay, nothing, all is said. His tongue is now a stringless instrument. Oh. Words, life, and all, old Lancaster has spread. Were York the next that must be bankrupt so? Though death be poor, it ends a mortal woe. Mm, the ripest fruit first falls, and so doth he. His time is spent. Our pilgrimage must be. So much for that. <laughs> now, for our Irish wars, we must supplant these rough, rug headed kerns which live like venom, where no venom else but only they have privilege to live. <laughs> <laughs> and for these great affairs, do ask some charge. Towards our assistance, we do seize to us the plate. Coin, revenue, and movables, whereof our uncle Gaunt did stand possessed. How long shall I be patient? Ah, how long shall tender duty make me suffer wrong? Mm. Not 
Gloucester's death, nor Herbert's banishment, nor Gaunt's rebukes, nor England's private wrongs have ever made me sour my patient cheek or bend one wrinkle on my sovereign's face. I am the last of noble Edward's sons, of whom thy father, Prince of Wales, was first. In war was never lion rage nor fierce, but when he frowned it was against the French, and not against his friends. His noble hand did win what he did spend, and spent not that which his triumphant father's hand had won. His hand was guilty of no kindred blood, but bloody with the enemies of his kin. Oh, Richard. York is too far gone with grief, or else he never would compare between. Why, uncle, what's the matter? <laughs> oh, my liege, pardon me. If not, I please not to be pardoned, am content with all. Seek you to seize and gripe into your hand the royalties and rights of banished Hereford. Uh -huh. Is not Gaunt dead and doth not Hereford live? Was not Gaunt just and is not Harry true? Did not the one deserve to have an heir? Is not the heir a well-deserving son? Ah, oh, for God, God forbid I speak true. If you do wrongfully seize Hereford's rights, call in letters patents that he had by his attorneys general to sue his livery and deny his offered homage, you pluck a thousand dangers on your head, you lose a thousand well-disposed hearts and prick my tender patience to those thoughts which honour and allegiance cannot think. Think? What you will. We seize into our hands his plate, his goods, his money, and his lands. I'll not be by the while. My liege, farewell. What will ensue hereof, there's none can tell. But by bad courses may be understood that their events can never fall out good. <laughs> Uh, go, Bushy, to the Earl of Wiltshire Strait. Bid him repair to us to Ely House to see this business. Tomorrow, next, we will for Ireland. And tis time, I trow. And we create, in absence of ourself, our Uncle York, Lord Governor of England. For he is just and always loved us well. <laughs> Come on, our Queen. Tomorrow must we part, be merry. For our time of stay is short. <coughs> well, lords, the Duke of Lancaster is dead. And living too. For now his son is Duke. Barely in title, not in revenues. Richly in both, if justice had a right. My heart is great. But it must break with silence, yet be disburdened with a liberal tongue. Nay, speak thy mind, and let him there speak more than speaks thy words again to do thee harm. Tames that that thou would speak to the Duke of Hereford. But if it be so, out with it boldly, man, quick, is mine ear to hear of good towards him? Or no good at all that I can do for him, unless you call it good to pity him, bereft and gelded of his patrimony. Now, afore God, to shame such wrongs are born in him, a royal prince, and many more of noble blood in this declining land. The king is not himself, but basely laid by flatterers. And what they will inform, merely in hate, against any of us all, that will the king severely prosecute against us, our lives, our children, and our heirs. Commons are they pilled with grievous taxes and quite lost their hearts. The nobles are they fined for ancient quarrels and quite lost their hearts. And daily new exactions are devised, as, as blanks. Benevolences and I what not what, but what a God's name doth become of this? More hath he spent in peace than his forebears in wars. Oh, the king's grown bankrupt like a broken man. Reproach and disillusion hangeth him. He hath not money for these Irish wars. His burden is taxation, notwithstanding, but by the robbing of the banished duke. His noble kinsman. <laughs> but lords, we hear this fearful tempest sing, yet seek no shelter to avoid the storm. We see the very rack that we must suffer, and unavoided is the danger now, for suffering so the causes of our wrath. Not so. Even through the hollow eyes of death, I spy life peering. But I dare not say how near the tidings of our comfort is. Nay, let us know thy thoughts as thou dost ours. I'll be confident to speak Northumberland. We three about thyself. 
and speaking so thy words about his thoughts. Therefore be bold. Then thus, I have received intelligence that Harry, Duke of Hereford, Reynold, Lord Cobham, his brother Archbishop late of Canterbury, Sir Thomas Erpingham, Sir John Ramston, with eight tall ships, 3,000 men of war, are making hither with all due expedience and shortly mean to touch our northern shore. And perhaps they had ere this, but that they stay the first departing of the king for Ireland. If then we shall shake off our slavish yoke, embout our drooping country's broken wing, redeem from broken pawn the blemished crown, and make high majesty look like itself, away with me in post to Ravensburg. But if you faint, is fearing to do so, stay and be secret, and myself will go. To horse, to horse, odd stouts to them that fear. Hold out my horse, and I will first be there. <laughs> Madam, your majesty is too much sad. You promised when you parted with the king to lay aside life-harming heaviness and entertain a cheerful disposition. To please the king I did, to please myself I cannot do it. Yet I know no cause why I should welcome such a guest as grief, save bidding farewell to so sweet a guest as my sweet Richard. Yet again, methinks, some unborn sorrow ripe in fortune's womb is coming towards me. And my inward soul with nothing trembles. At something it grieves more than with parting from my lord the king. Each substance of a grief hath twenty shadows that shows like grief itself, but is not so. For sorrow's eye, glazed with blinding tears, divides one thing entire to many objects, like perspectives, which rightly gazed upon show nothing but confusion, eyed or wry, distinguished form. Therefore, Christ, gracious queen, more than your lord's departure, weep not. More's not seen, or if it be, tis with false sorrow's eye, which for things true weeps, <laughs> things imaginary. It may be so, but yet my inward soul persuades me it is otherwise. How oh, it be, I cannot but be sad. Tis nothing but conceit, my gracious lady. Tis nothing less. Conceit is still derived from some forefather grief. Mine is not so. For well, nothing hath begot my something grief. God save your majesty, and well met, gentlemen. I hope the king is not yet shipped for Ireland. I hope so, so. Tis better hope he is, for his designs grave haste. His haste good hope, then wherefore dost thou hope he is not shipped? Uh, that he, our hope, might have retired his power, and driven into despair an enemy's hope, who strongly hath set footing in this land. Who? <coughs> the banished Bolingbroke. Repeals himself, and with uplifted arms, his safe arrived at Ravenspark. Now, oh, God in heaven forbid. Ah, oh, madam, tis too true. And that is worse, the Lord Northumberland, his son, young Henry Percy, the Lords of Ross, Beaumont, and Willoughby, with all their powerful friends, are fled to him. Why have you not declared Northumberland and all the rest revolted faction traitors? We have. Whereupon the Earl of Worcester hath broke his staff, resigned his stewardship, and all the household servants fled with him to Bolingbroke. So green thou art the midwife to my woe, and Bolingbroke my sorrow's dismal heir. Now hath my soul brought forth her prodigies. Despair not, madam. Who shall hinder me? I will despair and be at enmity with cousining hope. He is a flatterer, a parasite, a keeper back of death, who gently would dissolve the bands of life which falls hopefully as an extremity. There comes the Duke of York. Oh, full of careful business are his looks. Uncle... For God's sake, speak comfortable words. Should I do so, I should belie my thoughts. Comfort's in heaven, and we are on the earth, where nothing lives but crosses, cares, and griefs. Your husband is going to save far off, whilst others come to make him lose at home. And here am I, left to underprop his land, who, weak with age, cannot support himself. Now comes the sick hour that his surfeit made. Now shall he try his friends that flatter him. My lord... Your son was gone before I came. Why, so go all which way it will. The nobles they are fled. The commons cold and will, I fear, revolt on Hereford's side. Sarah, get thee too flashy to my sister Gloucester. Bid her send me presently a thousand pounds. Hold, here's my ring. My lord, 
I forgot to tell your lordship, the day as I came by, I called there. But I shall grieve you to report the rest. What is knave? An hour before I came, the Duchess died. God, for his mercy, what a tide of woes comes rushing on this woeful land at once. I know not what to do. I would to God that my untruth had not provoked him to it. The king had cut my head off with my brothers. Oh. What are the new posts dispatched for Ireland? How shall we do for money for these wars? Come, sister. Um, cousin, I should say, pray pardon me. Go, fellow, get thee home, provide some carts, and bring away the armor that is there. Gentlemen, will you go, Master Men? If I know how or which way to order these affairs thus thrust disorderly on my hands, never believe me. Both are my kinsmen. The one is my sovereign, whom both my oath and duty bids defend. The other again is my kinsman, whom the king hath wronged, whom conscience and my kindred bids to right. Well, somewhat we must do. Come, cousin, I'll dispose of you. Gentlemen, go muster up your men. And meet me presently at Barclay. Oh, I should to Plashy too, but time will not permit. All is uneven and everything is left at six and seven. Oh, the wind sits there for news to go for Ireland, but none returns. For us to levy power proportionable to the enemy is all impossible. Besides, our nearness to the king in love is near the hate of those who love not the king. And that's the wavering commons, for their love lies in their purses. And whoso empties them, why so much fills their heart with deadly hate. Wherein the king stands generally condemned. If judgment lie in them, then so do we. For we ever have been near the king. Well, I will for refuge straight to Bristow Castle. The Earl of Wiltshire is already there. Thither while I with you. For little office the hateful commons will perform for us. Except like curse to tear us all to pieces. Will you go along with us? No. I will to Ireland. To his majesty. Farewell. If heart presages be not vain, we three here part that ne shall meet again. That's as York thrives to beat back Bolingbroke. Alas, poor duke. The task he undertakes is numbering sands and drinking oceans dry. Where one on his side fights, thousands will fly. Farewell at once. For once, for all and ever. Well, we may meet again. I fear me never. How far is it, my lord, to Barclay now? Believe me, noble lord, I am a stranger here in Gloucestershire. These high, wild hills and rough and even ways draws out our miles and makes them wearisome. And yet your fair discourse hath been a sugar, making the hard ways sweet and delectable. But I would think me what a weary way from Ravensburg to Cotswold will be found in Ross and Wilderbury, wanting your company. Far less value is my company than your good words. Now, uh, who comes here? It is my son, young Harry Percy, sent from my brother Worcester whensoever. Harry! <laughs> I fear you not. Harry had thought my lord to have learned himself of you. Why? Was he not with the Queen? No, my good lord. He hath forsook the court, broken his staff of office, and dispersed the household of the king. What was his reason? He was not so resolved when last we spoke together. Because your lordship was proclaimed traitor. But he, my lord, is gone to Ravenspur to offer service to the Duke of Hereford and sent me over by Bartley to discover what power the Duke of York had levied there. Then, with directions to repair to Ravenspur. Have you forgot the Duke of Hereford, boy? No, my good lord, for that is not forgot which ne'er I did remember. To my knowledge, I never in my life did look on him. Then learn to know him now. This is the Duke. My gracious lord, I tender you my service, such as it is, being tender, raw, and young. I thank thee, gentle Percy, and be sure. I count myself in nothing else so happy. In a soul remembering my good friends. How far is it to Bartley? And what stir keeps good old York there with his men of war? There stands the castle by yon tuft of trees, manned with 300 men, as I've heard. Here come the lords of Ross and Willoughby. Bloody with sparing, fighting, great with haste. 
<laughs> Welcome, my lords. <laughs> I watch your love pursues a banished traitor. All my treasury is yet but unfelt thanks, which more enriched shall be your love and labor's recompense. Oh, your presence makes us rich, most noble lord. And far surmounts our labor to attain it. Evermore thanks the exchequer of the poor, which till my infant fortune comes to years stands for my bounty. Well, who comes here? It is my lord of Barclay, as I guess. My lord of Hereford, my message is to you. My lord, my answer is to Lancaster. And I am come to seek that name in England. And I must find that title in your tongue before I make reply to aught you say. Mistake me not, my lord. It is not my meaning to race one title of your honor out. To you, my lord, I come, what lord you will. From the most gracious regent of this land, the Duke of York to know what pricks you on, to take advantage of the absent time, and fright our native peace with self-born arms. I shall not need transport my words by you. Here comes his grace in person. My noble uncle. Show me thy humble heart and not thy knee, whose duty is deceivable and false. My gracious uncle. Ah, grace me no grace, nor uncle me no uncle. I am no traitor's uncle. And that word grace in an ungracious mouth is but profane. Why have those banished and forbidden legs dared once to touch one dust of England's ground? And then more why? Why have they marched so many miles upon her peaceful bosom Frighting her pale-faced villages with war and ostentation of despised arms. Comest thou because the anointed king is hence? Why, foolish boy, the king is left behind, and in my loyal bosom lies his power. Were I now but lord of such hot youth as when brave Gaunt, thy father and myself, rescued the black prince of Wales, that young Mars of men from forth the ranks of many thousand French, oh, then how swiftly would this arm of mine, now prisoner to the palsy, chastise thee and minister correction to thy fault? My gracious uncle, let me know my fault. On what condition stands it, and wherein? Even on condition of the worst degree, of gross rebellion and detested treason, thou art a banished man. And here art come before the expiration of thy time in braving arms against thy sovereign. As I was banished, I was banished Hereford. But as I come, I come for Lancaster. And noble uncle, I beseech your grace, look on my wrongs with an indifferent eye. You are my father. For methinks in you I see old Gaunt alive. Oh, then my father. Will you permit that I shall stand condemned, a wandering vagabond? My rights and royalties plucked from my arms perforce and given away to upstart unthrips? Wherefore was I born? If that my cousin king be king in England, it must be granted I am Duke of Lancaster. You have a son, O Merle, my noble cousin. Had you first died and he been thus trod down, he would have found his uncle gone to father to rouse his wrongs and chase them to the bay. I am denied to sue my livery here, yet my letters patron give me leave. My father's goods are all distrained and sold, and these and all are all misemployed. What would you have me do? I am a subject and I challenge law. Attorneys are denied me. Therefore, personally, I lay my claim to my inheritance of free descent. The noble Duke hath been too much abused. It stands, your grace, upon to do him right. This man by his endowments are made great. My lords of England, let me tell you this. I have had feelings of my cousin's wrongs and laboured all I could to do him right. But in this kind to come in braving arms, to be his own carver and cut out his way, to find out right with wrong, it may not be. Do you that do abet him in this kind cherish rebellion and our rebels all? The noble Duke hath sworn his coming is but for his own. And for the right of that we've all strongly sworn to give him aid. And now let him see joy that breaks that oath. Well, well, I see the issue of these arms. 
I cannot mend it, I must needs confess, because my power is weak and all ill left. But if I could, by him that gave me life, I would attach you all and make you stoop under the sovereign mercy of the king. But since I cannot, be it known unto you, I do remain as neuter. So fare you well. Unless it please you to enter in the castle and there repose you for this night. And, and... An offer, uncle, that we will accept. We must win your grace to go with us to Bristol Castle, which they say is held by Bushy, Baggart and their accomplices, the caterpillars of the Commonwealth, which I have sworn to weed and pluck away. It could be I will go with you, but yet I'll pause, for I am loath to break our country's laws. Nor friends, nor foes to me, welcome you are. Things past redress are now with me, past care. My lord of Salisbury, we have stayed ten days and hardly kept our countrymen together, and still we hear no tidings from the king. Therefore, we will disperse ourselves. Farewell. Stay yet another day, thou trusty Welshman. The king reposeth all his confidence in thee. He thought the king is dead. We will not stay. The bare trees in our country are all withered. And meteors fright the fixed stars of heaven. The pale-faced moon looks bloody on the earth. And lean-looked prophets whisper fearful change. Rich men look sad. Ruffians dance and leap. The one in fear to lose what they enjoy, the other to enjoy by rage and war. These signs for run the death or fall of kings. Farewell. Our countrymen are gone and fled. As well assured, Richard, their king is dead. Ah, uh, Richard. With the eyes of heavy mind. I see thy glory like a shooting star fall to the base earth from the firmament. Thy sun sets weeping in the lowly west, witnessing storms to come, woes and unrest. Thy friends are fled to wait upon thy foes, and crossly to thy good all fortune goes. Bring forth these men. she and green. I will not vex your souls, since presently your souls must part your bodies, with too much urging your pernicious lives, but were no charity. And yet, to wash your blood from off my hands, here in the view of men I will unfold some causes of your deaths. You have misled a prince, a royal king, a happy gentleman in blood and lineaments by you, unhappy and disfigured clean, who have in manner with your sinful hours made a divorce betwixt his queen and him, broke the possession of a royal bed, and stained the beauty of a fair queen's cheeks with tears drawn from her eyes by your foul wrongs. Myself, a prince by fortune of my birth, near to the king in blood, and near in love till you did make him misinterpret me, have stooped my neck under your injuries, and sighed my English breath in foreign clouds, eating the bitter bread of banishment, that you have fed upon my signories, disparked my parks and felled my forest woods, from mine own windows torn my household coats, raised up mine impress, leaving me no sign save men's opinion and my living blood to show the world I am a gentleman. This and much more, much more than twice all this condemns you to the death. See them delivered over to execution in the hand of death. 
More welcome is the stroke of death to me than Bolingbroke to England. Lords, farewell. My company is that heaven will take our souls and plague injustice with the pains of hell. My lord Northumberland, see them dispatched. Uncle, you say the queen is at your house. For God's sake, fairly let her be entreated. Tell her I send to her my kind commends. Take special care my greeting be delivered. A gentleman of mine I have dispatched with letters of your love to her at large. Thanks, gentle uncle. Now, lords, to fight with Glendower and his complices, who, as we hear, are armed and risen in Wales. Come, let's away. A while to work, and after... Holiday. <laughs> Castle, call they this, man? Yea, my lord. Our brooks will grace the air after you make tossing on the breaking seas. <sighs> Eves, must I like it well? I weep for joy to stand upon my kingdom once again. Dear earth, I do salute thee with my hands. Though rebels wound thee with our horses' hooves, as a long-parted mother with her child plays fondly with her tears and smiles in meeting, so weeping, smiling, greet I thee, my earth, and do thee favors with my royal hands. Feed not thy sovereign's foes, my gentle earth, nor with thy sweet comfort his ravenous sense, but let thy spiders that suck up thy venom and heavy-gated toads lie in their way, doing annoyance to the treacherous feet which with usurping steps do trample thee. Yield stinging nettles to mine enemies, and when they from thy bosom pluck a flower, guarded, I pray thee, with a lurking adder whose double tongue may with a mortal touch throw death upon my sovereign's enemies. <laughs> oh, mark not my senseless conjuration, lords. This earth shall have a feeling. These stones prove armed soldiers and her native king shall falter under foul rebellion's arms. Fear not, my lord. The power that made you king hath power to keep you king, in spite of all. <laughs> he means, my lord, that we are too remiss, mm -hmm. whilst Bolingbroke, through our security, grows strong oh. and great in substance and in power. Oh, oh discomfortable cousin! Knowest thou not that when the searching eye of heaven is hid behind the globe and lights the lower world, then thieves and robbers range abroad unseen in murders and in outrage boldly here? But when from under this terrestrial ball he fires the proud tops of the eastern pines and darts his light through every guilty hole, then murders, treasons, and detested sins, the cloak of night being plucked from off their backs, stand bare and naked, trembling at themselves. <laughs> so, and this thief, this traitor Bolingbroke, who all this while hath reveled in the night whilst we were wandering with the Antipodes, shall see us rising in our throne the east. His treasons will sit blushing in his face, not able to endure the sight of day, but self affrighted, tremble at his sin. Not all the water in the rough. Rude sea can wash the balm off from an anointed king. The breath of worldly men cannot depose the deputy elected by the Lord. For every man that Bolingbroke hath pressed to lift shrewd steel against our golden crown, God for his Richard hath in heavenly pay a glorious angel. Then if angels fight, weak men must fall, for heaven still guards the right. Welcome, my lord. How far off lies your power? No one near nor farther off, my gracious lord, than this weak arm. Discomfort guides my tongue and bids me speak of nothing but despair. One day too late, I fear me, noble lord, hath clouded all thy happy days on earth. 
Oh, call back yesterday. Big time return, and thou shalt have 12,000 fighting men. Today, today, unhappy day too late, or throws thy joys, friends, fortunes, and thy state. For all the Welshmen, hearing thou wert dead, are gone to Bolingbroke, dispersed and fled. Comfort, my liege. Why looks your grace so pale? Now the blood of 20,000 men did triumph in my face. And they are fled? Until so much blood thither come again, have I not reason to look pale and dead? All souls that will be safe fly from my side. For time has set a blot upon my pride. But my liege, remember who you are. I forgot myself. Am I not king? Awake, thou coward majesty, thou sleepest. Is not the king's name 20,000 names? Arm, arm my name. A puny subject strikes at thy great glory. Oh, look not to the ground, ye favourites of a king. Are we not high? High be our thoughts. I know my uncle York hath power enough to serve our turn. But who comes here? More health and happiness betide my liege than can my care-tuned tongue deliver him. My ear is open and my heart prepared. The worst is worldly loss thou canst unfold. Say, is my kingdom lost? Why? Twas my care, and what loss is it to be rid of care? Strives Bolingbroke to be as great as we? Greater he shall not be. If he serve God, we'll serve him too and be his fellow. So revolt our subjects. That we cannot mend. They break their faith to God as well as us. Cry woe, destruction, ruin and decay. The worst is death. And death will have his day. Glad am I that your highness is so armed to bear the tidings of calamity. Like an unseasonable stormy day, which makes the silver rivers drown their shores, so high above his limits swells the rage of Bolingbroke, covering your fearful land in hard, bright steel, and hearts harder than steel. White beards have armed their thin and hairless scalps against thy majesty. Boys with women's voices strive to speak big and clap their female joints in stiff, unwieldy arms against thy crown. My very beadsmen learn to bend their bows of double fatal you against thy state. Yea, distaff women manage rusty bills against thy seat. Both young and old rebel. And all goes worse than I have power to tell. Too well. Too well thou tellst a tale so ill. Where is the Earl of Wilshire? Hmm? Where is Bagot? What has become of Bushy? Where is Green? That they have let the dangerous enemy measure our confines with such peaceful steps? If we prevail, their heads shall pay for it. I warrant they have made peace with Bolingbroke. Peace have they made with him indeed, my lord. Oh, villains! Vipers! Damned with our redemption! Dogs easily wander forth on any man. Snakes in my heart, blood warm that steam my heart. Would they make peace? Terrible hell make war upon their spotted souls for this offense. Sweet love, I see, changing his property, turns to the sourest and most deadly hate. Again, uncurse their souls. Their peace is made with heads, not with hands. Those whom you curse have felt the worst of death's destroying wound and lie full low, graved in the hollow ground. Is Bushy Green and the Earl of Wiltshire dead? Aye. 
All of them at Bristol lost their heads. Where is the Duke, my father, with his power? No matter where. Of comfort no man speak. <laughs> Let's talk of graves, of worms, and epitaphs. Make dust our paper. And with rainy eyes, write sorrow on the bosom of the earth. Let's choose executors and talk of wills. And yet, not so. For what can we bequeath save our deposed bodies to the ground? Our lands, our lives, and all our Bolingbrokes. And nothing can we call our own but death and that small model of the barren earth which serves as paste and cover to our bones. For God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. How some have been deposed some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed, some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed, all murdered, all within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king keeps death his court. And there the antic sits, scoffing his state, and grinning at his pomp, allowing him a breath, a little scene to monarchize, be feared and kill with looks, infusing him with self and vain conceit. As if this flesh, which walls about our life, were brass impregnable, and humor thus comes at the last, and with a little pin bores through his castle wall, and farewell, king, cover your heads. And mock not flesh and blood with solemn reverence. Throw away respect, tradition, form, and ceremonious duty. For you have but mistook me all this while. I live with bread like you you want. Taste grief. Need friends. Subjected thus, how can you say to me, I am a king? My lord, wise men ne'er sit and wail their present woes, but presently prevent the ways to wail. To fight and die is death destroying death. Where fearing dying pays death servile breath. My father hath a power. Inquire of him and learn to make a body of a limb. Thou chidest me well. Proud Bolingbroke. I come to change blows with thee for our day of doom. Oh, this ague of fit of fear is overblown. An easy task it is to win our own, say Scroop. Well, eyes our uncle with his power. Speak sweetly, man, although thy looks be sour. Men judge by the complexion of the sky, the state and inclination of the day. So may you by my dull and heavy eye. My tongue hath but a heavier tale to say. I play the torturer. By small and small to linger out the worst that must be spoken. Your uncle York is joined with Bolingbroke. And all your northern castles yielded up. And all your southern gentlemen in arms upon his party. I was said enough. Beshrew thee, cousin, which this lead me for of that sweet way I was in to despair. What say you now? 
Hmm? What comfort have we now? By heavens, I'll hate him everlastingly that bids me be of comfort any more. Go to Flint Castle. There I'll pine away. A king, woe slave, shall kingly woe obey. That power I have, discharge. And let them go to ear the land that has some hope to grow. For I have none. Let no man speak again to alter this, for counsel is but vain. My liege, one word. He does me double wrong that wounds me with the flatteries of his tongue. Discharge my followers. Let them hence away. From Richard's night to Bolingbroke's fair day. But by this intelligence we learn, the Welshmen are dispersed. And Salisbury hath gone to meet the king, who lately landed with some few private friends upon this coast. News is very fair and good, my lord. Richard, not far from hence, hath hid his head. It would beseem the Lord Northumberland to say, King Richard, alack the heavy day that such a sacred king should hide his head. Your grace mistakes, only to be brief, left eyes title out. The time... But by this intelligence we learn, the Welshmen are dispersed. And Salisbury hath gone to meet the king, who lately landed with some few private friends upon this coast. News is very fair and good, my lord. Richard, not far from hence, hath hid his head. It would beseem the Lord Northumberland to say, King Richard, alack the heavy day that such a sacred king should hide his head. Your grace mistakes, only to be brief, left eyes title out. The time had been, would you have been so brief with him, he would have been so brief with you to shorten you for taking so the head your whole head's length. Mistake not, uncle, further than you should. Take not, good cousin, further than you should, lest you mistake the heavens are o'er our heads. I know it, uncle. And oppose not myself against their wills. Welcome, Harry. What will not this castle yield? The castle royally is manned, my lord, against thy entrance. Royally? Why, it contains no king. Yes, my lord. It doth contain a king. King Richard lies within the limits of yon lame and stone. And with him are the Lord Omo, Lord Salisbury, Sir Stephen Scroop, Besides the clergyman of holy reverence, who I cannot learn. Oh, if you like, it's the Bishop of Carlisle. Noble Lord, go to the rude ribs of that ancient castle. Through brazen trumpets, send the breath of Pile into his ruined ears. And thus deliver. Henry Bolingbroke on both knees doth kiss King Richard's hand. And sends allegiance and true faith of heart to his most royal person. Hither come even at his feet to lay my arms in power, provided that my banishment repealed, my lands restored again be freely granted. If not, I'll use the advantage of my power to lay the summer's dust with showers of blood rain from the wounds of slaughtered Englishmen. The which, how far off from the mind of Bolingbroke it is such, crimson tempest should bedrench the fresh green lap fair King Richard's land, my stooping duty tenderly shall show. Go signify as much. Whilst here we march upon the grassy carpet of the plain, we'll march without the noise of threatening drum. And from yon castle's tattered battlements, our fair appointments may be well perused. 
For methinks King Richard and myself should meet with no less terror than the elements. He be the fire, I'll be the yielding water, the rage be his. Whilst on the earth I rain my waters, on the earth, not on him. March on! Mark King Richard, how he looks. Richard doth himself appear, as doth the blushing, discontented sun, from out the fiery portal of the east, when he perceives the envious clouds are bent to dim his glory, and stain the track of his bright passage to the occident. Yet looks he like a king, behold his eye, bright as is the eagle's lightens forth, controlling majesty, alack, alack, for woe that any harm should stain so fair a show. We are amazed. And thus long have we stood to watch the fearful bending of thy knee, because we thought ourselves thy lawful king. And if we be, how dare thy joints forget to pay their awful duty to our presence? If we be not, show us the hand of God that hath dismissed us from our stewardship. For well we know no hand of blood and bone can gripe the sacred handle of our scepter unless ye do profane, steal, or usurp. And though you think that all, as you have done, have torn their souls by turning them from us, and we are barren and bereft of friends, yet no, my master, God omnipotent, is mustering in the clouds on our behalf armies of pestilence. And they shall strike your children, ye unborn and unbegot, and lift your vassal hands against my head, and fret the glory of my precious crown. Tell Bolingbroke, for yond methinks he stands that every stride he takes upon my land is dangerous treason. He has come to ope the purple testament of bleeding war. And ere the crown he looks for live in peace, ten thousand bloody crowns of mother's sons shall ill become the flower of England's face, change the complexion of her maid pale peace to scarlet indignation, and bedew her past his grass, with faithful English blood. The king of heaven forbid our lord the king should so with civil and uncivil arms be rushed upon. Thy thrice noble cousin Harry Bolingbroke doth wholly kiss thy hand, and by the honourable tomb he swears that stands upon your royal grandsire's bones, and by the royalties of both your bloods, currents that spring from one most gracious head, and by the worth and honour of himself, comprising all that may be sworn or said. His coming hither hath no further scope than for his lineal royalties, and to beg enfranchisement immediate on his knees, which, on thy royal party granted once, his glittering arms he will commend to rust, his barbed steeds to stables, and his heart to faithful service of your majesty. This swears as he is a prince and just, and as I am a gentleman, I credit him. Northumberland, to say thus the king returns. His noble cousin is right welcome hither, and all the number of his fair demands should be accomplished without contradiction. 
With all the gracious utterance thou hast, speak to his gentle hearing, kind commands. We can debase ourselves, Catherine, do we not? To look so poorly and to speak so fair, shall we call back Northumberland and send defiance to the traitor and so die? No, good my lord. Let's fight with gentle words till time lend friends and friends their helpful souls. Oh, God! Oh, God! That ere this tongue of mine, that laid the sentence of dread banishment on yon proud man, should take it off again with words of truth. Oh, that I were as great as is my grief, or lesser than my name. Oh, that I could forget what I have been, or not remember what I must be now. Northumberland comes back from Bolingbroke. What? Must the king do now? Must he submit? The king shall do it. Must he be deposed? The king shall be contented. Must he lose the name of king? God's name, let it go. I'll give my jewels for a set of beads. My gorgeous palace for a hermitage. My gay apparel for an armsman's gown. My figured goblets for a dish of wood. My scepter for a palmer's walking staff. My subjects for a pair of carved saints. And my large kingdom for a little grave. A little, little grave, an obscure grave. And I'll be buried in the king's highway some way of common trade where subjects' feet may hourly trample on their sovereign's head for on my heart they tread now whilst I live and buried once, why not upon my head? Oh no, thou <laughs> weepest, my tender-hearted cousin. We'll make foul weather with despised tears. Our sighs and they shall lodge the summer corn and make a dearth in this revolting land. Or shall we play the wantons with our woes and make some pretty match with shedding tears as thus to drop them still upon one place till they have fretted us a pair of graves within the earth and then in lave here lies two kinsmen dig their graves with weeping eyes. Was not this ill do well? Well, well, I see I talk but idly and you laugh at me. Most mighty prince, my lord Northumberland, what says King Bolingbroke? Will his majesty give Richard leave to live till Richard die? You make a leg, and Bolingbroke says I. My lord, in the base court, he doth attend to speak with you. May it please you to come down. Down. Down I come. Like glistering Phaethon, wanting the manage of unruly jades. In the base court, base court, where kings grow base, to come a traitor's calls and do them grace. In the base court, come down. Down court. Down king. The night owl shriek where mounting larks should sing. What says his majesty? Sorrow and grief of heart make him speak fondly like a frantic man. Yet he is come. Stand all apart and show fair duty to his majesty. My noble lord. Fair cousin. You debase your princely knee to make the base earth proud with kissing it. I rather had my heart might feel your love than my unpleased eye see your courtesy. Up, cousin, up. Your heart is up, I know. Thus high at least, although your knee be low. 
My gracious lord, I come but for mine own. Your own is yours. And I am yours. And all. So far be mine, my most redoubted lord, as my fair service shall deserve your love. Well, you deserve. They well deserve to have you know, the strongest and surest way to get. Uncle, give me your hand. Nay, dry your eyes. Tears show their love, but want their remedies. Cousin, I am too young to be your father, though you are old enough to be my heir. What you will have, I'll give, and willing to, or do we must what force will have us do. Set on towards London. Cousin, is it so? Yea, my good lord. Then I must not say no. What sport shall we devise here in this garden to drive away the heavy thought of care? Madam, we'll play at bowls. It will make me think the world is full of rubs and that my fortune runs against the bias. Madam, we'll dance. My legs can keep no measure in delight when my poor heart no measure keeps in grief. Therefore, no dancing, girl, some other sport. Madam, we'll tell tales. Of sorrow or of joy? Of either, madam. Of neither, girl. For if of joy being altogether wanting, it doth remember me the more of sorrow. Or if of grief being altogether had, it adds more sorrow to my want of joy. Madam, I'll sing. It is well that thou hast cause, but thou shouldst please me better, wouldst thou weep. I could weep, madam, would it do you good? And I could sing, would weeping do me good, and never borrow any tear of thee. But stay, here come the gardeners. Let's step into the shadow of these trees. My wretchedness into a row of kings, they will talk of state. For everyone, not so. Go. Find the hot young dangling apricocks, which, like unruly children, make their sire stoop with oppression of their prodigal wheat. Give some supportance to the bending twigs. Go thou, and like an executioner, cut off the heads of two fast-growing sprays that look too lofty in our commonwealth. All must be even in our government. You will not employ? I'll go root away the noisome weeds that without profit suck the soil's fertility from wholesome flowers. Why should we, in the compass of a pile, keep lore and form in due proportion, showing us in a model our firm estate? When our sea walled garden, the old land is full of weeds, the fairest flowers choked up, the fruit trees all unpruned, their edges ruined, their knots disordered, and her wholesome herbs swarming with caterpillars. Hold thy peace. He that have suffered this. Disordered spring hath now himself met with fall of leaf. The weeds which his broad spreading leaves did shelter that seemed in eating him to hold him up are plucked up, root and all, by Bolingbroke. I mean, you're a Wiltshire, bushy, green. What are they, Dad? They are. And Bolingbroke hath seized the wasteful king. Oh, what pity is it that he had not so trimmed and dressed his land as we this garden. But we at time of year to wound the bark, the skin of our fruit trees, lest being overproud in sap and blood, 
With too much riches it confound itself. Had he done so to great and growing men, they might have lived to bear, and he to taste their fruits of duty. Superfluous branches we lop away that bearing boughs might live. Had he done so, himself had borne the crown, which waste of idle hours hath quite thrown down. What? Think you the king shall be thee post? Depressed he is already. Deposed. Tis doubt he will be. Letters came last night to a dear friend of the good Duke of York to tell black tidings. Oh, I am pressed to death for want of speaking. Thou, old Adam's likeness, set to dress this garden. How dares thy harsh, rude tongue sound this unpleasing news? What Eve, what serpent hath suggested thee to make a second fall of cursed man? Why dost thou say King Richard is deposed? Darest thou, thou little better thing than earth, divine his downfall? Say where, when, and how camest thou by these ill tidings? Speak, thou wretch! Pardon me, madam. Little joy have I to breathe these news, yet what I say is true. King Richard, he is in the mighty hold of Bolingbroke. The fortunes both are weighed. And your lord's scale is nothing but himself and some few vanities that make him light. But in the balance of great Bolingbroke, besides himself, are all the English peers. And with that odds, he weighs King Richard down. Post you to London, and you'll find it so. Speak no more than every one doth know. Nimble mischance that art so light of foot. Doth not thy embassage belong to me, and am I last that knows it? Come, let's go. To meet at London, London's king in woe. What was I born to this, that my sad look should grace the triumph of great Bolingbroke? Gardener, for telling me these news of woe, pray God the plants our grass may never grow. All forth, Packet. Now, Packet, freely speak thy mind what thou dost know of noble Gloucester's death. Who wrought it with the king? And who performed the bloody office of his timeless end? Then set before my face the Lord Omer. Cousin, stand forth and look upon that man. My Lord Omer, I know your daring tongue scorns to unsay what once it hath delivered. In that dead time, when Gloucester's death was plotted, I heard you say, Is not my arm of length that reacheth from the restful English court as far as Callus to mine uncle's head? Amongst much other talk that very time, I heard you say, you would rather refuse the offer of an hundred thousand crowns than Bolingbroke's return to England, adding with all how blessed this land would be in this your cousin's death. <laughs> Princes and noble lords, what answer shall I make to this base man? Shall I so much dishonour my fair stars on equal terms to give him chastisement? Either I must, or have my honour soiled by the attainder of his slanderous lips. There is my gauge, the manual seal of death that marks the hour for hell. I say thou liest, and will maintain that what thou sayest is false, even in thy heart blood, being all too base to stain the temper of my knightly sword. Baggot, forbear. Thou shalt not take it up. If to thy valour stand on sympathy, then is my gage, Homo, engaged to thine. By that fair sun which shows thee where thou standst, I heard thee say, and vauntingly thou spakest it, that thou wert cause of noble Gloucester's death. If thou deniest it twenty times, thou liest, and I will turn thy falsehood to thy heart, where it was forged, with my rapier's point. Thou durst not, coward, live to see that day. By my soul, I would it were this hour. Westmoreland, thou art damned to hell for this. Oh, no, thou liest! 
His honour is as true at this appeal as thou art all unjust, and that thou art so. There are from my gauge to prove it on thee to the extremest point of mortal breathing. Seize it, if thou durst. And if I do not, may my hands rot off and never brandish more revengeful steel over the glittering helmets of my foes. I cast fear to the like forsworn, O Merle, and spur thee on with full as many lies as may be hollowed in thy treacherous ear from sun to sun. There is my honest Paul. Who sets me else? By heavens, I'll throw it all. I have a thousand spirits in one breast to answer twenty thousand such as yours. As I hope to thrive in this new world, Omar is guilty of my true appeal. Besides, I heard the banished Mowbray say that thou, Omar, did send two of thy men to execute the noble Duke at Calais. Some honest Christian trust me with a gauge. But Mowbray lies. Here do I throw down this, if he may be repealed to try his honour. These differences shall all rest under gauge till Mowbray be repealed. And repealed he shall be. And for mine enemy restored again to all his lands and sinuries. When he's returned, against O'Merle we will enforce his trial. That honourable day shall ne'er be seen. Many a time hath banished Mowbray fought for Jesu Christ. In glorious Christian fields, streaming the ensign of the Christian cross against black pagans, Turks, and Saracens. And toiled with works of war, retired himself to Italy, and there at Venice gave his body to that pleasant country's earth. And his pure soul unto his captain, Christ, under whose colors he had fought so long. Why, Bishop is Mowbray dead. As surely as I live, my lord. Sweet peace conduct his sweet soul to the bosom of good old Abraham. Lords of Pellants, these differences shall all rest <laughs> under gauge till we assign you to your days of trial. Great Duke of Lancaster, I come to thee from plume plucked Richard who with willing soul adopts the heir and his high scepter yields unto the possession of thy royal hand. Ascend his throne, descending now from him, and long live Henry, fourth of that name. In God's name I'll ascend the regal throne. Mary, God forbid! Worst in this royal presence may I speak, yet best beseeming me to speak the truth. Would God that any in this noble presence were enough noble to be upright judge of noble Richard, that true noblesse would learn him forbearance from so foul a wrong. What subject can give sentence on his king? And who is here that is not Richard's subject? For thieves are not judged, but they are by to hear, although apparent guilt be seen in them. And shall the figure of God's majesty, his captain, steward, deputy elect, anointed, crowned, planted many years, be judged by subject and inferior breath, and he himself not present? Oh, for offended God, that in a Christian climate souls refined should show so heinous, black, obscene a deed. I speak to subjects. And the subject speaks stirred up by God thus boldly for his king. My lord of Hereford here, whom you call king, is a found traitor to proud Hereford's king. And if you crown him, let me prophesy the blood of English shall manure the ground and future ages groan for this foul act. Peace shall go sleep with Turks and infidels. And in this seat of peace, tumultuous war shall kin with kin and kind with kind confound. Disorder, horror, fear, and mutiny shall here inhabit, and this land be called the field of Golgotha, and dead men's skulls. For if you raise this house against this house, it will the woefulest division prove that ever fell upon this cursed earth. Prevent it. Resist it. Let it not be so. Lest child, child's children, Cry against you, woe. 
Well, have you argued, sir? And for your pains of capital treason, we do arrest you here. My Lord Willoughby be at your charge to keep him safely till his day of trial. May it please you, Lords, to grant the common suit. A virtue, though, Richard, that in common view he may surrender. So shall we proceed without suspicion. I will be his conduct. Lords, you that here are under our arrest, procure your sureties for your days of answer. Little are we beholding to your love, and little looked for at your helping hands. Why am I sent for to a king? Before I have shook off the regal thoughts wherewith I reigned. I hardly yet have learned to insinuate, flatter, bow, and bend my knee. Give sorrow leave a while to tutor me to this submission. Yet I well remember the favors of these men. Were they not mine? Did they not sometime cry all hail to me? So Judas did to Christ. But he and twelve found truth in all but one. I in twelve thousand, none. God save the king. Will no man say amen? Am I both priest and clerk? Well then, amen. God save the king. Although I be not he, and yet amen if heaven do think him me. To do what service am I sent for hither? to do that office of thine own good will, which tired majesty did make thee offer, the resignation of thy state and crown to Henry Bolingbroke. Give me the crown. Here, cousin, seize the crown. side my hand and on that side thine. Now is this golden crown like a deep well that owes two buckets filling one another, the emptier ever dancing in the air, the other down unseen and full of water. That bucket down and full of tears am I drinking my griefs whilst you mount up on high. I thought you had been willing to resign. My crown I am, but still my griefs are mine. You may my glories and my state depose, but not my grief, still am I king of those. Part of your cares you give me with the crown. Your care set up, do not pluck my cares down. My care is loss of care, by old care done. Your care is gain of care, by new care won. The cares I give, I have, though given away. They tend the crown, yet still with me they stay. Are you contented to resign the crown? No. No. I, for I must nothing be. Therefore, no, no, for I resign to thee. Now mark me how I will undo myself. I give this heavy weight from off my head. And this unwieldy scepter from my hand. The pride of kingly sway from out my heart. With mine own tears I wash away my barb. 
With mine own hands, I give away my crown. With mine own tongue, deny my sacred state. With mine own breath, release all duteous oaths. All pomp and majesty, I do forswear. My manners, rents, revenues, I forgo. My acts, decrees, and statutes, I deny. God pardon all that are broke to me. God keep all vows unbroke, I mean to thee. Make me that nothing hath, with nothing grieved, and thou with all pleased that hast all achieved. Long mayest thou live in Richard's seat to sit, and soon lie Richard in an earthy pit. God save King Henry, and King Richard says, send him many years of sunshine days. What more remains? No more. But that you read these accusations and these grievous crimes committed by your person and your followers against the state and profit of this land, that by confessing them, the souls of men may deem that you are worthily deposed. Must I do so? Must I ravel out my weaved up folly? Gentle Northumberland, if thy offences were upon record, would it not shame thee in so fair a troop to read a lecture of them? If thou shouldst there, shouldst thou find one heinous article containing the deposing of a king and cracking the strong warrant of an oath marked with a blot damned in the book of heaven. May all of you that stand and look upon me I have the my wretchedness to beat myself. Though some of you with pilot wash your hands showing an outward pity Yet you, pilots, have here delivered me to my sour cross, and water cannot wash away your sin. My lord, dispatch, read this paper on. My eyes are full of tears. I cannot see. And yet salt water blinds them not so much, but they can see a sort of traitors here. Nay, if I turn mine eyes upon myself, I find myself a traitor with the rest. For here have I given my soul's consent to undeck the pompous body of a king, make glory base and sovereignty a slave, proud majesty a subject, state a peasant, my lord. no lord of thine, no haught insulting man, nor no man's lord. I have no name, no title. No, not that name was given me at the font, but tis usurped. Lack the heavy day. I have worn so many winters out and know not now what name to call myself. Oh, that I were mockery king of snow standing before the sun of Bolingbroke to melt myself away in water drops. Good king, great king, and yet not greatly good. And if my word be sterling yet in England, let it command a mirror hither straight, that it may show me what a face I have, since it is bankrupt of its majesty. Go some of you and fetch a looking glass. My lord, read this paper oil while the glass does come. The fiend that torments me ere I come to hell. Urge it no more, my lord Northumberland. The commons will not make me satisfied. I shall be satisfied. I'll read enough when I do see the very book indeed where all my sins are writ. And that's myself. Give me the glass. And therein will I read. No deeper wrinkles yet. 
hath sorrow struck so many blows upon this face of mine and made no deeper wound. Oh, flattering glass, like to my followers in prosperity, thou dost beguile me. Was this face the face that every day under his household roof did keep 10,000 men? Was this the face that like the sun did make beholders wink? Was this the face that faced so many follies and was at last outfaced by Bolingbroke? A brittle glory shineth in this face. As brittle as the glory is the face. For there it lies, cracked in a hundred shivers. Mark, silent king. The moral of this sport. How soon my sorrow hath destroyed my face. The shadow of your sorrow hath destroyed the shadow of your face. Say that again. The shadow of my sorrow. <sighs> Let's see. It is very true. My grief lies all within, and these external manners of laments are merely shadows to the unseen grief that swells with silence in the tortured soul. There lies the substance. And I thank thee, King, for thy great bounty that not only givest me cause to wail, but teaches me the way how to lament the cause. I'll beg one boon and, and be gone, trouble you no more. Shall I obtain it? Name it, fair cousin. Fair cousin. I am greater than a king, for when I was a king, my flatterers were then but subjects. Being now a subject, I have a king here to my flatterer. <laughs> Being so great, I have no need to beg. Yet ask. And shall I have? You shall. And give me leave to go. Whither? Whither you will. So I will from your sights. You know, some of you convey him to the tower. Oh, good. Convey. Convey as you all, and rise thus nimbly by a true king's fall. On Wednesday next, we solemnly set down our coronation. Lords, prepare yourselves. <laughs> King will come. This is the way to Julius Caesar's ill erected tower, to whose flint bosom my condemned lord is doomed a prisoner by a proud Bolingbroke. Here, let us rest. If this rebellious earth have any resting for her true king's queen. But so. But see. Or rather, do not see my fair rose wither. Yet look up, behold that you in pity may dissolve to dew and wash him fresh again with true love tears. Art thou the model where old Troy did stand, thou map of honour, thou King Richard's tomb and not King Richard, thou most beauteous inn. Why should hard-favoured grief be lodged in thee when triumph is become an alehouse guest? Joy not with grief, fair woman. Do 
not so to make my end too sudden. Learn, good soul, to think our form state a happy dream, from which await the truth of what we are shows us but this. I am sworn brother sweet to grim necessity, and he and I will keep a league till death. Highly to France and, and cloister thee in some religious house, our holy lives must win a new world's crown, which our profane hours here quite thrown down. What is my Richard both unshapen to mine, transformed and weakened? Hath Bolingbroke deposed thine intellect? Hath he been in thy heart? The lion dying thrusteth forth his paw and wounds the earth, if nothing else, with rage to be o'erpowered. And wilt thou, pupil like, take for correction, mildly kiss the rod and fall on rage with base humility, which art a lion and the king of beasts? <laughs> a king of beasts, indeed. If aught but beasts, I had been still a happy king of men. Good sometime, queen. Prepare thee hence for France. Think I am dead, and that even here thou takest us from my deathbed thy last living leave. In winter's tedious nights, sit by the fire with good old folks, and let them tell thee tales of woeful ages long ago but it. When e'er thou bid good night to quit their grief, Tell thou the lamentable tale of me. Send the hearers weeping to their beds. For why? The senseless brands will sympathize the heavy accent of thy moving tongue, and in compassion weep the fire out. And some will mourn in ashes, some coal black, for the deposing of a rightful king. My lord, the mind of Bolingbroke is changed. You must to Pomfret, not into the tower. And, madam, there is all to take for you with all swift speed. You must away to France. Northumberland. Thou ladder, wherewithal the mounting Bolingbroke ascends my throne. The time shall not be many hours of age more than it is. Ere foul sin, gathering heads, shall break into corruption. Thou shalt think. Though he divide the realm and give thee half, it is too little helping him to all. And he shall think that thou, which knowest the way to plant unrightful kings, would know again, being ne'er so little urged, another way to pluck him headlong from the usurped throne. The love of wicked men converts to fear, that fear to hate, and hate turns one or both to worthy danger and deserved death. My guilt be on thy head and there an end. Take leave in part. You must part for prison. Doubly divorced. Bad men! You violate a twofold marriage. Twigs my crown and me, and then betwixt me and my married wife. Let me unkiss the oath twixt thee and me. And yes, not so, for the kiss was made. Part is not unburnt. I towards the north, where shivering, cold, and sickness pines the climb. My wife for France, from where set forth in pomp, she came adorned hither like sweet May, sent back like Halimus or shortest of day. And must we be divided? Must we part? I hand from hand, my love. And heart from heart. Banish us both and send the king with me. That were some love, but little policy. Then whither he goes, thither let me go. So two together weeping make one woe. Weep thou for me in France. I for thee here. Better far off than near be near than near. Come, come. In morning sorrow let's be brief. Since wedding it, there is such length in grief. One kiss shall stop our mouths, and then we part. Thus give I mine, and thus take I thy heart. Give me mine own again. We make woe wanton with this fond delay. Once more adieu. 
The rest let sorrow say. Didst thou not mark the king what words he spake? Have I no friend will rid me of this living fear? Was it not so? These were his very words. Have I no friend, quoth he? He spake it twice and urged it twice together, did he not? He did. And speaking it, he wishly looked on me as who would say, I would thou work the man that could divorce this terror from my heart. Meaning the king had poverty. Come, let's go. I am the king's friend and will rid his foe. studying how I may compare this prison where I live unto the world and for because the world is populous and here is not a creature but myself I cannot do it yet I'll hammer it out my brain, I'll prove the female to my soul, my soul the father, and these two beget a generation of still breeding thoughts, and these same thoughts people this little world, I am humors like the people of this world, for no thought is contented, the better sort as thoughts of things divine are intermixed with scruples and do set the word itself against the word as thus come little ones and then again it is as hard to come as for a camel to threat the postern of a small needle's eye thoughts tending to ambition they do plot unlikely wonders are these vain weak nails might tear a passage through the flinty ribs of this harsh world my ragged prison walls and for they cannot die in their own pride thoughts tending to contend flatter themselves that they are not the first of fortune's fools nor shall not be the last like silly beggars who sitting in the stocks refuge their shame that many have and others must sit there and in this thought they find a kind of ease bearing their own misfortunes on the back of such as have before endured the like Thus play I in one person, many people, and none contented. Sometimes am I king, then treasons make me wish myself a beggar, and so I am. Then crushing penury persuades me I was better when a king. Then am I kinged again. And by and by, I think that I am unkinged by Bolingbroke and straight am nothing. But whate'er I be, nor I, nor any band that but man is, with nothing shall be pleased till he be eased with being nothing. Music do I hear? Ah, ah, keep time. How sour sweet music is. 
When time is broken, no proportion kept. So is it in the music of men's lives. And here have I, the daintiness of ear, to check time broken a disordered string. But for the concord of my state, time had not an ear to hear my true time broke. I wasted time. And now does time waste me? For now hath time made me his numbering clock. My thoughts are minutes, and with sighs they jar their watches on unto my eyes, the outward watch. Where to my finger, like the dial's point, is pointing still in cleansing of tears. Now, sir. The sound that tells what hour it is are clamorous groans and strike upon my heart, which is the bell. The sighs and tears and groans show minutes, times, and hours. But my time runs posting on in boring brokes, proud joy while I stand. Fooling here is Jack of the Cloth. The music lads me. <laughs> Let it sound no more. For though it is a madman to their wits, in me it seems it will make wise men mad. That blessing on his heart that gives it me. It is a sign of love. And love to Richard is a strange brooch in this all-hating world. Hey, royal prince. Thanks, noble peer. The cheapest of us is ten groats too dear. What art thou? Ha! How comes thou hither when no man never comes? But that sad wretch that brings me food to make misfortune live. I were a poor groom of thy stable, king, when thou wert king. Who, travelling towards York, where much ado, at length have gotten leave to look upon my sometimes royal master's face. <laughs> oh, how it earned my heart when I beheld in London streets that coronation day, when Bolingbroke rode on Roan Barbary. That horse that thou so often hast bestrid, that horse that I so carefully have dressed. Rode he on Barbary? Oh, tell me, gentle friend, how went he under him? So proudly, as if he disdained the ground. Mm, so proud that Bolingbroke was on his back. <laughs> that jade that he bred from my royal hand. This hand hath made him proud with clapping him. Oh, would he not stumble? Would he not fall down, since pride must have a fall and break the neck of that proud man that did usurp his back? Forgiveness, horse. Why do I rail on thee, since thou, created to be awed by man, wast born to bear? I was not made a horse, yet I bear the burden like an ass, spurred, galled, and tired by Johnson Bolingbroke. Fellow, give place. Here is no longer stay. If, if thou love me, tis time thou wert away. What my tongue dared not, that my heart shall say. My lord, what please you to fall to? Taste of it first, as thou art wont to do. Oh, my lord, I dare not. Sir Pierce of Exton, who lately came from the king, commands the country. The devil take. 
Henry of Lancaster and thee. Patience is still! fire stack is thus my person exclaim thy fierce hand hath with the king's blood stained the king's own land none my soul thy seat is up on high as my gross flesh sinks downward As full of valor as of royal blood. Both have I spilled. Oh, with the deeper good. For now the devil that told me I did well says this deed is chronicled in hell. This dead king to the living king out there. Take hence the rest and give them burial here. <laughs> No man tell me of my unthrifty son. It is full three months since I did see him last. If any plague hang o'er us, tis he. I would to God, my lords, he could be found. Inquired at London at the taverns there. But there, they say, he daily doth frequent with unrestrained loose companions. Even such, they say, as stand in narrow lanes and beat our watch and rob our passengers. Whilst he, young, wanton and effeminate boy, Takes on the point of honour to support so dissolute a crew. My lord, son, two days since I saw the prince and told him of those triumphs held at Oxford. What said the gallant? His answer was he would under the stews, and from the commonest creature pluck a glove and wear it as a favour. And with that he would unhorse the lustiest challenger. As dissolute as desperate. Great king, within this coffin I present thy buried fear. Here in all breathless lies the mightiest of thy greatest enemies, Richard of Bordeaux, hither by me brought. Exton, I thank thee not. For thou hast wrought a deed of slander with thy fatal hand upon my head and all this famous land. By your own mouth, my lord, did I this deed. They love not poison that do poison need, nor do I thee. Oh, I did wish him dead. I hate the murderer, love him, murder it. The guilt of conscience take thee for thy labor, but neither my good word nor princely favor. With Cain go wander for a shade of night and never show thy face by day nor light. Lords, I protest. My soul is full of woe that blood should sprinkle me to make me grow. Come, mourn with me for what I do lament, and put on sullen black incontinent. I'll make a voyage to the Holy Land to wash this blood off from my guilty hand. March sadly after, grace my mourning here with weeping after this untimely beard. 